Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks a lot for joining this uh, presentation. My name is uh, Vijayendran Subramaniam. I'm a senior software engineer uh, working at the ARM Open Source Software Group. Uh, in this uh, presentation, we are going to discuss about uh, booting Linux on an ARM C6 enabled uh, quad chiplet uh, platform. So the agenda of this uh, presentation is to discuss what is a multi-chip platform and the important software aspects of a multi-chip boot. Uh, to drive this discussion, we will take uh, ARM reference server platform as an example, but the flow discussed in this presentation should be applicable for any ARM-based uh, uh, multi-chip platform as well. We'll begin with the understanding of a single chip boot flow and we'll extend uh, uh, it to a multi-chip boot flow. Finally, we'll briefly see the ACPA tables which are used to describe the multi-chip uh, topology to the operating system. So in the, in, in the recent days, the functionality and performance of uh, any system on chip is increasing ever. And the number of uh, cores on a chip also, is also increasing and there are different custom IPs being included in, uh, on a chip to accelerate uh, or to serve a specific workload. This results in increased die size, and as the die size increases, there is a risk of reduced yield. Uh, one simple error or one single error in any part of the die could rule out the entire chip, which could cost a lot. Let's say we want to build a chip with 256 cores, the current manufacturing process might not help, or even if it helps, the yield might be very low uh, and the cost uh, of the manufacturing could be very high. One of the solutions to overcome this uh, problem is to build a chiplet-based uh, system or a socket-based uh, system where multiple socks are packaged in a single die and joined using a coherent uh, link in case of a, a chiplet-based platform or multiple chip chips are connected through a high-speed physical link in case of socket-based system. Oh, chiplet uh, can be a homogeneous uh, platform where identical chips are packaged uh, um, in, a, in a single die or a heterogeneous platform like shown in this figure where uh, identical chips along with the custom accelerator is also packaged within a single die itself to probably uh, tailor to a specific workload. So this presentation is centered around the platform built around ARM-based IPs. ARM has Neoverse reference design platform which is a collection of ARM IPs with Neover CPU to build a server-based platform targeting cloud infrastructure and edge computing. We'll use Neover's RD platform as an example to drive this discussion. But as I mentioned, the boot flow discussed in this presentation should be applicable to other ARM-based multi-chip platform as well. So now what is a Neover's uh, reference uh, design platform? So as the name suggests, it's a complete reference uh, design with a, with a collection of documentation, fixed virtual platform, and uh, a software stack to support uh, development, modification, and to build a server-based platform. The key component in a Neoverse RD platform includes a Neoverse CPU, a manageability control processor, a system control processor, a high-speed uh, coherent interconnect, which is uh, based on uh, coherent mesh network IPs, uh, a memory controller, either it can be ARM-based or a third-party memory controller, uh, IO, IP, and a PCIe IP. SCP and MCP are based on Cortex MCPUs. Uh, SCP is responsible for uh, power management uh, for the AP cores, uh, interconnect setup, and memory controller setup. MCP is responsible for communicating with the baseboard management controller, otherwise popularly known as BMC. The software stack includes SAP from a trusted firmware for application code process, uh, Tiana Core CDK2 implementation of UFA as a bootloader, Grub2 as a voice loader, and uh, Neoverse RD platform supports all major versions of Linux distribution, including Red Hat, uh, Fedora Server, uh, Ubuntu, and Debian. So before jumping into the details of the multi-chip platform and the boot flow in the multi-chip platform, let's discuss the boot flow in the single chip platform. The boot flow between single chip and multi-chip uh, platform remains mostly the same. And the key difference between these two will be discussed in the subsequent slide. So it all starts uh, with the NAR flash, which packages uh, the required images for the boot ROM 
in each processor to load uh, um, uh, to load the runtime firmware. As shown in the flash, it contains the runtime firmware for all the CPUs in the system. During the reset, SCP and MCP will power on and execute the bootroom code, uh, bootroom code, which will load the respective runtime firmware stage from the North, North flash. So once the loading is complete, uh, the transfer will get the, uh, the execution will get transferred to the SCP uh, and MCP runtime firmware. Um, SCP RAM code will initialize the high-speed interconnect memory controller power policy unit for application processor cores. Once these initialization are complete, it will turn on the primary core, uh, typically CPU zero in a system, which will start executing the AP ROM code. So AP ROM code is a, is a BL1, it is named as BL bootloader stage one. Uh, it will verify the signature of the next stage, BL2, and uh, it will load the BL2 stage from the non flash into the secure SRAM for the execution. The transfer will get, uh, the execution will get transferred to BL2. Uh, BL2 being executed at the secure EL1 run is responsible for authenticating and loading the next bootloader stages. Uh, it will authenticate and load uh, BL3.1, which is the EL3 runtime firmware. Optionally, BL3.2, uh, which is the UFI manageability mode software, uh, which typically will be used uh, in case of secure boot, uh, in case of UFI secure boot is enabled. And finally, it will load the BL3.3 stage, which uh, in case of RD platform is UFI. Once the image load is complete, the execution will get transferred to the BL31, which is executing on a DRAM uh, region. So BL31 being our EL3 runtime firmware is responsible for setting up the GIC distributor and redistributor, and also the SCMA channel. SCMA uh, is a system control and management interface, is an ARM specification on how, how message uh, passing between AP core and SCP, SCP core should happen in case of a system where uh, the application core power management is done by the SCP. GIC and SCMA initialization are uh, important in case of multi-chip system, and this will be discussed uh, in the subsequent slides. And once the BL331 uh, uh, stage completes its initialization, the transfer of execution will happen to uh, BL33, and it will complete all its stage, and it will uh, load the actual operating system. RD platform not only implements a uh, single chip uh, platform, but also extends its implementation to a multi-chip variant as well. It currently supports uh, dual chip and quad chip variants. Uh, let's begin the discussion with uh, dual chip platform and let's try to understand what makes it a, uh, it's a dual chip platform. Individually, these two are a single chip platform and both are opaque to each other in terms of uh, memory and peripherals on the other chips. So what, need, what is needed to make uh, it as a dual chip platform is for each chip to access each other chip's memory uh, in a coherent fashion. It also need to access the peripherals on the other chip as well. If this is enabled on the ARM platform by C6 link. On other architecture, it could be other protocol depending upon the interconnect use. The same idea can be extended to a quad chiplet uh, as well, where um, on a, if there are four chips available, uh, it would require a total of six, uh, uh, six six links to create uh, this in cross end connection to allow each chip to access each other chip. CCX is a high-speed uh, coherent uh, interconnect protocol, uh, which enables coherent access, transfer of uh, transfer of kick interrupts, DVM message passing, and exclusives ac across each chip. CCX is uh, developed uh, for the, uh, to allow uh, multi-chip operation and for um, accelerator operation with the coherent memory access. Now let's see how uh, multi-chip boot flow uh, differ, differs from the single chip boot flow and how the memory map will look in case of a multi-chip platform. Uh, uh, similar to single chip uh, boot, uh, at the reset, SCP on each chip will initialize the interconnect memory and, uh, um, and the PPUs on its uh, own chip. 
when the scp detects that the platform has a multi chip mode enable uh, by reading the system id registers uh, it will uh, begin uh, the setup of this coherent link chip 0 for example will begin by bringing up the coherent link between chip 0 and chip 1 so at the beginning uh, chip 0 will have only the local memory view uh in case of rd platform uh, the each chip will have a memory size of 0 to 4 tb and uh, for the remote chips it will be offset by 4 tb so which means that chip 1 have memory space of 4 tb to 8 tb chip 2 will have 8 tb to 12 tb and so on so once the c6 uh, link is established uh, uh, chip 0 will have a uh, full view of chip 1 memory as well the same process will get repeated for establishing the c6 link to other chips as well once chip 0 establishes the link uh, between uh, chip 0 and chip 2 chip 0 and chip 3 it will have the complete memory view of other chips as well now the same process will be repeated by other uh, chips to bring up uh, the c6 link and uh, once the c6 links are established a single view of memory will be applicable uh, for all the chips ranging from 0 to 16 tb in case of a quad chip finally like we have uh, seen in the single chip boot flow the primary chip scp will turn on the cpu 0 uh, which will go on to boot uh, uh, its boot load stages pl3 pl1 pl2 and pl31 boot load stages the important point to note here is that the scp on the other chips will go on to idle stage uh, idle state it won't turn on any cores on its uh, own chip at this point like we discussed earlier bl31 is responsible for initializing the generic interrupt controller so in this slide we'll see how gig distributor and gig redistributor works in case of a single chip uh, platform which will help uh, the uh, help the understanding of uh, gig's role in a multi chip uh, system gig mainly handles uh, three main uh, types of in interrupts namely private peripheral interrupt a software generated interrupt and shared the peripheral interrupt ppis as the name suggests are private to the cpu uh, so gig t will not play any role in handling the ppu ppi interrupts scis are generated by cpu which targets other cpu with the mpidr value so for example sci from cpu 1 if it targets cpu 3 will reach uh, gig t and based on the target mpidr value gig t will transfer uh, transfer to the corresponding redistributor in this example it will transfer this sci to the redistributor on the cpu 3 similarly spis are also shared among the cpus gig t is responsible for forwarding the spis to a specific redistributor now in case of a multi chip uh, scenario sci from uh, chip 0 cpu can target a cpu on chip 2 or chip 3 and so on um and similarly the spi on a uh, generator from the chip 0 can can be handled uh, by a uh, cpu on other chip as well so the gig t from all the chip has to talk to each other and work in sync uh, in case of a multi chip operation from gig 600 onwards support for multi chip has been enabled uh, to the ip itself to allow multiple chips to exchange the messages and interrupts So let's see how gig uh, d init uh, how bl31 initializes the gig t in case of a multi chip scenario so bl31 will detect uh, the platform supports multi chip operation by reading the system id registers um and it will start uh, with the programming of gig t on the primary chip by writing to the mmio region on the in the primary chip so what will it will program is that it will begin by programming the ids or addresses of the remote uh, chip uh, gig uh, distributor so it will also set up the routing table uh, for the spi so what this uh, table tells uh, is that the range of what what are all the range of spi ids each chip has to handle so if uh, spi is uh, uh generator it will be routed to the corresponding chip by looking at this table for example uh in this example uh spi id is 32 to 255 is handled by chip 
and uh, SPI IDs uh, 512 to 959 will be handled by each one. Finally, uh, it will enable GIGT for uh, multi-chip operation. Once this operation is enabled, uh, it will make GIGT uh, on the primary chip will make a connection to the remote uh, uh, remote chips GIGT um, with the help of uh, the IDs or address it includes uh, in the main space. So once the uh, connection is established, all the GIGT will work in, in a synchronized uh, fashion. So any rights to any of this uh, GIGT uh, DMMAO uh, region will get, get reflected to all GIGT uh, distributor. So from this point, it suffice to say that uh, all the GIGT will act as a one single entity. An example uh, GIGT uh, uh, initialization for quad chip RD platform is linked here. So another important aspect of a multi-chip boot is uh, SCMI channel initialization by PL31. So like we discussed, uh, SCMI is a standard uh, published by ARM to standardize this message communication between AP core and SAP on a system with SAP being responsible for system control, such as uh, turning on the CPU, turning off the CPU, um, scaling up the frequency and so on. So during the SAP boot, SAP on each chip will zero out the messaging region on its own address space. So there will be four SEMA uh, message regions in case of a quad chip system. Since uh, BL31 uh, is running on the CPU of chip zero, it can initialize its message uh, region on its own chip. Now there is only one copy of BL31 running on this entire system and there are no AP core running on this other chip. So there won't be any separate copy of BL31 running on the other chip so that it can initialize its own chip. So what BL31 will do at this point is that it will take advantage of the C a coherent CCX link to initialize the region on the other chips. Now, like we discussed, once the CCX link is established, chip zero will have complete view of the other uh, chip's memory as well. Now, BL31 will do that. Uh, it will take adv advantage of the coherent uh, CCX link to initialize the region on the other chips. So it will start uh, initializing the SEMA regions on all the other three chips as well. So what uh, this tells us is that effectively, effectively the EL3 runtime from running on the primary core uh, will be able to share the SEMA messages with the remote chips SCP without any involvement of the AP cores on the remote chip itself. This is enabled through this uh, CCX uh, link. Now the stage is uh, set for the OS to load on this uh, multi-chip system. So BL31 will complete its job and it will transfer, transition to a runtime uh, firmware stage and it will transfer its execution to the UFI. So UFI uh, in turn will complete all its stages such as Dixie, VDS, and it will finally load the Linux OS. So EFI is also responsible for sharing the ACPI tables to describe the system topology to the operating system. We'll, we'll see that briefly in the next slides. So once the OS uh, boots, it will read the MADT table uh, and will start uh, doing a PSCI calls to the runtime firmware in order to turn on the secondary cores. So for the local chip, uh, it, uh, the process is same uh, as the single chip system where runtime firmware will use the SEMI shared region uh, to do SEMI calls uh, to the SCP to turn on the secondary cores on the local chip. So SCP will turn on the CPU one uh, and uh, the Linux context will start learning on the CPU one. So as and when the secondary core comes up, the Linux context will start executing in the secondary CPUs as well. Now, when the Linux uh, makes the PSA call to turn on the CPU four, uh, which is uh, which is the CPU zero on the chip uh, one, BL31 will realize that 
CPU re resides on the CPU one by reading the MP ADR value, and it will make a CMI call on the shared memory region in the chip one address space. So this will allow the SCP on the chip one to turn on the CPU four uh, on its chip. Since the coherent uh, link has been established and it's a coherent memory, the CPU four will uh, come up and the Linux uh, will start executing on the CPU four also. CPU four uh, also, courtesy of uh, the CCX link. And the process will uh, repeat it for other CPUs on the chip one and uh, the same process will get repeated for all the CPUs on the other uh, chips as well, chip uh, two and chip three. Now all the 16 CPUs uh, will be turned on and the Linux will, Linux context will run on all this uh, CPU in a coherent fashion. So e the Linux uh, running on each uh, CPU uh, will be able to have a complete view of memory and MMAO space. So this complete uh, the boot of uh, Linux on a multi-chip system. So before concluding, let's, let's talk briefly about the ACPA tables used to describe the system topology to the operating system so that the OS can optimize its uh, process allocation and memory accesses. MADT table is used to describe the CPU uh, information along with the uh, Kik P and Kik R base addresses. The CPU information are uh, described uh, with the MPIDR value, uh, which will have the affinity information, including the chip ID, cluster ID, and core IDs. The second table is uh, SRA table. Uh, it describes the memory and processor affinity. Uh, in the example we discussed, each uh, chip's memory and CPU uh, are assigned with the proximity ID. For example, chip, chip zero's memory and chip uh, zero's CPUs are assigned as proximity zero, and chip one's uh, memory and chip one CPUs are assigned with the proximity ID one. The next table is HMAT table. It is used to describe the cache information and mainly the latency values between each proximity domains. The numbers used here are arbitrary values and it varies based on the platform. So in this example, uh, we can see that latency uh, between its own proximity uh, is low while uh, the latency across uh, the proximity is the, double the time. So between the proximity is 10 nanoseconds as well across the proximity is uh, 20 nanoseconds. As usual, the example uh, to this SCPI tables are linked here. So uh, this, this slide shows how the SCPI tables looks in terms of the code. You can see uh, that MADT table has uh, the various uh, CPU information for each chip. Uh, gig uh, redistributor base addresses. The SRA table has uh, memory affinity and processor affinity information, while the HMAT table has a uh, matrix of the latency information across various proximity domain. So that uh, concludes uh, this uh, presentation. Uh, to briefly summarize, we have seen what is a chiplet flat platform and the boot flow for a multi-chip is discussed on the Neoverse RD platform. And here are some of the useful links about Neoverse reference design platform. And the last link uh, is to a developer documentation on how to sync and use the software stack. And thanks a lot for joining this presentation. Hope you have a great day.